Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar by Data Platform Geeks. Uh, my name is Rohit, and I will be your host for today. Our today's webinar is on launching a data science project. Cleaning is half the battle by uh, Kevin Fiesel, who is an MVP from the U United States. And our today's moderator will be Satya Ramesh, who will be helping us with the Q&A. So a quick couple of things about eDominus systems. Uh, we have a, uh, a very pop, we have a lot of popular brands under eDominus systems like SQL Maestros, where, which, where we offer uh, the master classes, which are uh, uh, most advanced trainings on SQL Server and Microsoft Data Platform. Uh, we have the learning kits, we have the video courses, and we have the unique learnings called the hands-on labs. Uh, I will speak about all of this a little later. Uh, we have the people where India. Uh, where we offer a lot of corporate training and our very own uh, popular product called Expand SM ERP. And of course, our very popular data platform Geeks, a community of data analytics professionals. Uh, we, all, we do our annual conference under Data Platform Geeks, that is the Data Platform Summit. Uh, we have already launched uh, DPS 2019 this year. Uh, this is our theme and logo, as you can see on your screen. And our title is Empowering Data and AI Transformation. Uh, the summit will be on 20, it's going to be a three day summit on 22nd, 23rd and 24th of August. Uh, and we ha also have the pre-cons, which are four day classroom trainings on 19th, 20th and 21st August at Radisson Blue in Bangalore. Uh, this is a pick from the last year. It was, uh, it was at the, at the keynote of uh, Mr. Rohan Kumar, who is a corporate vice president of the Azure Data Group. On the stage, you can see him and the entire Redmond team. Uh, we had more than 1,000 people com coming down from over 16 countries and 300 plus companies. It, it was massive. So uh, we, we, we went a step ahead and we, we this time have three days of pre-cons on 19th, 20th and 21st. We uh, earlier had only two days of pre-cons in 2018. So uh, I mentioned the dates earlier and we will have seven tracks with 100 plus sessions and 50 plus speakers. Uh, and of course, the world's best trainers will be flying down to Bangalore to deliver uh, these trainings. Uh, one of the main reasons DPS is uh, very popular among the data analytics crowd is because there is 100% learning and 0% marketing. So go ahead and visit dps10.com. You'll find all the details there. And if you have any queries or, uh, regarding corporate nominations, etc., you can write to contact at dps10.com or you can directly reach out to uh, the mobile number. Uh, Satya will be putting down all of this in the chat window for you to use. So this will be the home page of uh, when you visit dps10.com. Uh, you can click on book now if you, if you uh, wish to uh, register uh, right away. Or if you would want our, uh, our team members to reach out to your company and send an invitation for the summit. Uh, because of course the companies have a training budget and they can of course sponsor you. So it would be absolutely free for you. So you can click on would you like the DPS team to invite your company and our team will get in touch with you. So why should you really care about the summit? First of all, it's about uh, if you if you wish to reskill and upskill, this is the place for you. And uh, like I mentioned, uh, world's best will be flying down to Bangalore from Microsoft, Redmond, and 16 plus countries who are uh, MVPs, MCMs, and whatnot. They will you will get to interact with them directly. So uh, it also gives you a networking op opportunity and making connections for life. And uh, you will find the world's best infrastructure, Tradison do, and DPS involves the community. So what does that mean? You uh, you get to learn what you choose. So uh, all our sessions, all the 100 plus sessions that happen at the summit will be put up for voting for the community and you get to choose what you want to learn at the summit. So the next steps will be uh, go ahead and evaluate DPS, uh, visit dps10.com and uh, browse our past conferences, the speakers that are come and then you can um, make your choice. Uh, this is the DPG core team, Amit Bansal, the founder and president. We have Manohar Kuna, who is the vice president. Uh, we have uh, Avnish Vijay, uh, Vijay Reddy. And our US member uh, for the regional mentor is Anupama Natrajan, who is an MVP from New Zealand. Uh, Sandeep Pani, we have uh, Prince Rastogi, Surbhi Agarwal, Sakharam Shindi, and Dev Dattanath as well. Uh, these are the dominant teams from Kolkata and uh, Bangalore who help us make the, uh, do these events and the conferences. Uh, yes, this was on at DPS 2018. You can see Amit Bansal and the DPG Core team and uh, the eDominor teams on the stage. Special thanks to Microsoft for supporting us in all our community initiatives for many years now. Uh, so DPG community, a lot of you must have, uh, at, uh, this must be your first webinar. So you, uh, things that you don't know is that we also have a lot of free videos on our YouTube channels and on our official website that is dataplatformgeeks.com and a lot of hands-on labs that you can try out. 
So go ahead and use all of that. We also have the new meetup model. Uh, if you wish to host meetups uh, in your own organization, you can just reach out to us and fill out the regional mentor form in the in, in our, on our website, and we will reach out to you. So if you have any questions beyond this webinar, uh, you can uh, put it up in, your, in our Facebook groups, the LinkedIn group. And of course, we are on uh, Telegram as well, which is a mobile app. So you can, uh, you can join all these groups. Uh, we, yes, all our webinars are recorded and will be uploaded in on, uh, on, on our YouTube channel. Our official YouTube channel is youtube.com slash SQL Server Geeks. And we also have a lot of free SQL videos that we do uh, on our SQL Maestro's YouTube channel. So you can uh, check out that as well. And do not forget to subscribe to get those notifications. So uh, without any further delay, let's welcome uh, Kevin. Uh, over to you, Kevin. Great. Good evening, everybody, or good morning if you're where I am. I am going to share my full screen, and we will get started. There we go. So we're going to talk about launching a data science project. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Kevin Fiesel. I'm a Microsoft Data Platform MVP out of Durham, North Carolina. I'm CTO at a company called Envisage, and I have a website. Uh, curated SQL. The idea of curated SQL is that I want to try to find and link to five to ten interesting blog posts somewhere in the data platform space. So that could be database administration or development, could be Power BI, R, Hadoop, Python, R, Spark, uh, anything in that broad data platform space. So that's curatedsql.com. To give some flavor to where we're going with this talk, I like to start with a few data adages. And my first one is that clean data is an aspiration. Uh, we'll never have truly clean data for several reasons, which you can read on the screen. I'm not going to read them all for you. Uh, that would be boring. What I will point out is the bottom one, which is my favorite. This comes from a, a Nobel Prize winning economist who wrote a paper uh, saying that this information uh, data will necessarily abstract the particulars of time and place. So what that means is there's a lot of subjective information that never gets captured written down any place and you cannot combine together that those subjective pieces of information. Even if you could write them down, they're not really uh, groupable in a way that regular data uh, could be. So the data that we have necessarily will only explain a fragment of the total of reality. Regardless, we have to do something to figure it out. Um, that's kind of what I get paid to do, so I've got to do something. And the way that we try to do something is through processes. Uh, we build and implement processes that help us walk through a problem and get to a reasonable solution. One of the processes, the one that we'll talk about today, is called the Microsoft Team Data Science Process. It looks a bit like this. I will say that in my day-to-day -day life, I manage a predictive analytics team, and we don't exactly follow this process, but we do follow something that is pretty close to it. What I really like about this process is that it is uh, intentionally iterative. What I mean is, you may start out here looking at business understanding. So we start talking to people, asking questions. We start looking for data. Well, as we find data, we're gonna come back and ask questions. And we may bounce back and forth through here for a while until we get to a point where, okay, it's time to create a model. So we create a model and we create the model and it gives us results that are way outside of what we expect. So we may jump back to business understanding a bit. And as you bounce around between these steps, eventually you deploy and you get to the end phase. The way that we're going to walk through this process is we'll cover each of those big circles as independent sections. So each one of those is uh, an area where we'll focus for a while and then we'll have walked through the entire process. The motivating example I want to use is the 2018 Data Professional Salary Survey that Brent Ozar put out. The 2019 edition has been released, but I haven't updated this, the, uh, the notebook yet that I'm going to use. So we'll live with 2018 for now. Uh, 
Along this process, we're going to walk through the implementation details, so you'll have a simple example of a data science project. So first step, business understanding. This comes when somebody who is usually pretty high up on the business side wants a data science project. They're willing to give you a big sack of money to implement something, but the problem is that usually they don't know exactly what they want and may not be able to articulate exactly what the end goal is. So one of our jobs as a group, part of a group running a data science project is in figuring out that person's vision. That person has an idea for what they want the project to look like. It's up to us to figure out how we can take what they think they want and shape it in a way to give them what they want. It helps if you have a deep knowledge of the domain. So if you're in the world of, say, manufacturing, having knowledge of manufacturing processes, of workflows, of uh, logistics chains, understanding where the supplies come from, what types of things people do, and you know, how you generate those final products, this will help because the better you understand the business side, the easier they will be able to explain what they want to you. However, uh, even if you are the top expert in manufacturing, you still want to talk to that champion because that's the person giving you the money, that's the person who will ultimately define what is success. When we talk to this champion, we should be on the lookout for specific types of questions. Each of the questions lists, listed on here will cover some types of models, some types of algorithms. So there's a huge difference between somebody asking, how many products do we have that fail uh, testing during the course of the day versus how can we segment out products on line one versus products on line two into categories of uh, say which products are more likely to be successful commercially. Those are different questions and the way that you'll attack each question is quite different. Uh, pay attention to what they're asking for because if you try to solve something like which of the five options should I choose by building out the best regression model ever, um, you may not actually have given them the answer that they want. You might not have answered the question they want, even if your model is really accurate. If it doesn't solve their problems, it's ultimately a failure. So we want to nail down a specific problem with a specific answer. You know, these are examples of the types of uh, problem spaces that I like because they are not vague. They are specific. They have an area where I can say, here is my criteria for success. Like, given a title and a description for a product, so we have inputs, tell me with at least 90% probability, so we have a measure of success, a listing category that Amazon will consider valid, so we have that external validation criterion. Given this information, I can now understand what type of algorithm I should use, uh, or at least what types of algorithms make sense to test. We have a final goal, and we have the uh, way that we're going to validate that goal. So if I start building a model that's like 70% probable, you know, 70 probability of success, I can say, I'm on the way there, but I'm not there yet. And if I incrementally move that number up, that accuracy value up, then I can you know, tell that I'm making progress. And once I hit 90, now I can say, okay, this is a successful launch. Not all questions or problem spaces are going to be this succinct or this complete. In a lot of cases, we're dealing with vagarities. Well, we want products to be listed on Amazon, you know, almost all of the time. Uh, I don't know exactly what I'm going to send to Amazon, and I don't know how they actually test it. 
I'm not even sure how to get that data, but we want it to work. Unfortunately, that's the type of problem statement that you'll usually get at the beginning. And as you walk through the process, hopefully you can firm up that problem statement uh, and be able to come up with, you know, here is a final successful statement and a measure for success. As you work through this, you're talking to the business side. You also want to build up your set of data sources and put together a data dictionary. This is going to help you quite a bit as you work on launching a product. Your data dictionary is going to tell you where that source is located, the hopefully the origination of that source, what data types and formats you have available, how big that data set is, if there are rules around what values can be, then having those as well. Where this is extremely helpful is, you may know today, this data source came from somebody over in the marketing department, uh, they have an access database that has this information. Six months from now, as you're scrambling, trying to launch the product, you may not quite remember where that piece of information came from. And if you need it again, you might have to dig through a lot of documentation. You may have to try to piece it back together from emails or whatever. Uh, when, if you have the data dictionary, it'll help you quite a bit. It'll, you'll be able to look at it and get information. Oh, well that came from marketing, that came from an access database. Here were the credentials needed to access that database. And here's the other ancillary information, like how they got that information to begin with. You also wanna know where are you going with this data? So you build out a model. What happens next? There are a few different options. One option could be that you're building this thing out as, a, as an API. And now some other engineering team might call your API, get their results, and use that for their own purposes. Another option is maybe you get a bunch of files in and you have data that you want to generate predictions against and you'll dump all of that into a data warehouse. Well, those are two separate solutions that are going to have two separate uh, engineering implementations. So how you architect a solution is going to matter depending on well, what people wanna use the data for. The example that I'm going to use today is that we work for a company called Data Platform Specialists. Our job is to provide database administrators and other data platform professionals with some valuable market knowledge. We've come into possession of a survey of data professionals and would like to share with our client base uh, some insights that we've discovered from it. So here on the screen is a quick Excel uh, spreadsheet with some of the columns in that survey. So we can see already that, for example, uh, we've got people from multiple countries. Because we have people from multiple countries, we're going to have different styles of zip code. So in the United States, generally, we have a five-digit zip code or five-digit hyphen four-digit. While in Canada, they have two sets of three characters. Now, with the Canadian example, this zip code can get you down to very close to a single person's house. So in a lot of cases, they'll only put the first three characters because that gets you to a rough city area, maybe a little bit closer to a city. You know, sort of like the equivalent of the five digit zip code for the United States. So we'll be dealing with this type of dirty data. I consider it dirty because we have 376. Well, there's a question, is that 00376, which is a valid zip code? Is it maybe, uh, it starts with 376 and then they just took off the last two digits to make it uh, a little, save a little bit of privacy that way? We're not sure. So we already have some issues that we'll have to deal with in this data. Now, going back to our questions, we can talk to our champion. 
these are the sorts of questions that we might be listening for. One example is how much money does a database administrator make? And what are the criteria for helping determine how much money a DBA makes? So we have quite a few different possible questions. When talking to our stakeholders, we may get to the following question. How much money should we expect a data professional will make? Unfortunately, that's still pretty vague. And we don't have a strong feeling of accuracy of what is success. What we have is just a starting point. So as we iterate, you know, we may develop models, we may design things, come back to the business side, and we'll get a better idea, hopefully, as we go along, of how things are going. As I build out my data set, I'm looking at the data dictionary, I can start to see shapes of data. So for example, there's one column that's called telecommute days per week, which has six values in it. Less than one, one, two, three, four, and five or more. That's how many days a week this person can be expected to work from home. This is called a categorical variable. You have distinct values that are just uh, discrete categories. This is also more specifically an ordered categorical variable because we have a direct ordering. Less than one is inherently a lower number than one. By contrast, we have another column, hours worked per week. It's an integer that ranges from five hours to 200 hours per week. And 200 is a special number. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit. So the end result of this product, our company wants to build a website and allow people who've created profiles on that website to get an estimation of how much money they might be making in these different roles. We're going to build a microservice API which returns a dollar amount based on the inputs, at least hypothetically. I won't have time to get into that code today. Uh, I will have some discussion about it, but that's our end product. So let's talk data processing. This is the biggest portion of the show uh, in real life and in this uh, presentation. We have a few different activities that we perform during data processing. The first one is data gathering. Again, this is an iterative process. We're going to go back over and over, looking for new sources, reevaluating existing sources that maybe we threw away because they weren't good enough. Because at first we may not know exactly what we need, and as we move further, we may need to evaluate a bit better. Perhaps we threw away a resource early on because it didn't seem to fit. But as we found a new data source somewhere else, now it makes that old resource fit again. So the types of sources you may get, generally internal proprietary data. Your company's data is going to be your biggest location for sources. And that can be everything from spreadsheets on somebody's desktop machine, uh, files that are in uh, SharePoint, or data in SQL servers, or uh, on warehouses, uh, Hadoop clusters, data lakes. Think about everywhere in the organization that somebody can store information, and that's a valid starting point. It's a huge space just to begin with. From there, you can go uh, and enrich your data with open data sources. So these tend to be government or academic data sets. You can buy uh, data as well from APIs that you pay for or maybe data that you buy from someone. You can even commission surveys. Go out and ask people their opinions on things and use that as inputs for your models. So it's not just limited to what you have in the company right now. In our example, we are going to just use that data source, that survey data. We could enrich it with other information. 
one of the things that I've thought about doing before, I had a blog post on a previous version of this survey, purchasing power parity, gross domestic product per capita, to normalize salaries across countries. So a person making $100,000 in Canada, even if it's in US dollars, has a different purchasing power than a person making $100,000 in the United States, which is different than a person making $100,000 in India. As you go further down, within cities, within provinces or states, the uh, purchasing power will be different. So in the United States, cost of living is, can range uh, considerably. Where I'm at, for example, we're about average in terms of cost of living. New York City is about three times as expensive as in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. So a person making $100,000 in New York City has a lower standard of living than the person making $100,000 in Raleigh, Durham. It's another reason to come to Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. Uh, so we can also use other information to try to normalize our results, to try to get a, a better idea of how much this dollar amount really means for people. Cleaning is half the battle. I mean, it is in the title, so you figure that would be correct. But it turns out you're actually going to be a data plumber uh, most of the time, more than 50%. In actuality, the number that I tend to hear is 80%. My statement is 90% plus or minus five. We will spend that much time working with our data, getting data, cleaning data, analyzing data, realizing the data is no good, repeating the process. Data cleansing has a lot of activities. We can change the way that the data is shaped. Maybe I'm joining to other data sources and I need to find appropriate keys. Well, you'll find a lot of problems as you start working with data sets. And I have on here several categories of problems. For time purposes, and because uh, this is probably an area where most of the audience is most familiar, I'm going to breeze through this a bit. With mismatched data, we may have data that is just incorrect. So the label might be incorrect. A uh, label is the thing that you're trying to predict. On our data professional salary survey, our label is the salary. A person who makes $50,000 a year, if they accidentally type 500,000, we have mislabeled data. That means that if we take the $500,000, our outputs will be a little bit more incorrect because we had some bad input data. Any bit of information can be invalid. So it's not just the labels that are important. The inputs are important as well. Usually what we'll find is that uh, a change, one wrong input feature is not usually as bad as having the wrong label. So getting the right salaries is more important relative to getting the right input features. People don't always fill out all of the data, so you may have to deal with missing data. Sometimes we won't have certain columns, and we've got a few options of what we could do. If you only have a couple of pieces of information missing, I would probably delete the rows. For an analysis, you don't have to use every single row. It is perhaps better in some cases to use all of the rows, but it's not a requirement. And if, if removing a couple percent of the rows allows you to do something that you could not otherwise do because of a uh, reason for statistics, I'm okay with removing those rows generally. If the missing value is something you don't even care about, I'd just ignore it. Uh, for example, middle names, people don't often fill out middle names when they have forms. Unless you are predicting something based on middle name, I wouldn't even care about that column. I would just ignore it altogether. If you do care about it and you cannot delete it, then we have a couple of options. One of them is to substitute with the median, where the median is the 50th percentile value. 
at least if you're working with a continuous variable like a dollar amount or a number of years of education or something like that. We may also regress one feature against other features. So I may build out one model just to predict my missing values for this thing that I can feed into another model. That does happen in the data science world and it's, it's perfectly reasonable. You do run the risk of losing a bit of information or having a higher error rate because you're having a much noisier inputs. You may have to worry about duplicate data. For a data science analysis, I don't worry so much about this because if I have 10,000 people, 10,000 people in my survey, and one person accidentally clicked the button three times and is in there three times, that's not going to affect my survey. If I have 10,000 people and one person accidentally clicked the button one million times, that could affect my survey. Then I want to filter out all but the one row. In some cases, you may have inconsistent data. In system A, I make $10 per hour. In system B, I make $12 per hour. Trying to, to reconcile these two may be difficult. Sometimes it's because I got a promotion, so now I make $12, but system A doesn't have my promotion info yet. Or system A is older, system B is newer. Uh, sometimes I work in this office, and this office's information is up to date, but the central data isn't yet. Regardless of whatever reason, we have to be able to handle those differences as we join together data sets. And that's part of the problem as a data scientist is trying to reconcile inconsistent data sets. Unfortunately, there's not always a good rule. If you have timestamps, those could work where I'll take the later date. But if I don't have timestamps, uh, I may have to talk to the business people and try to, to come up with when do I take one versus the other. If you have data which is in a flat file or a text format, well, you could have misshapen data. You might not have enough delimiters. Maybe you have too many delimiters. Or maybe it's a new line in the middle of a row or you cut off records. If you have this data in a relational database, or if you're using a format like Parquet or Orc uh, when working with Hadoop, data shape is enforced on rows, so you're going to get the right shape. That won't be a problem. You may have other problems like inconsistent data or duplicate data, but at least it won't be misshapen. In addition to worrying about the shape of the data in terms of how it's laid out on a file, we can't reshape data to make it easier to analyze. The biggest one here is, called, is uh, vectorizing. So I would use vectorizing for natural language processing. I have a set of words, and I'm going to turn each word into a number. So maybe this is number one, this is number two, and so on. Then I can do matrix operations off of that data and uh, use it to try to determine, for example, if this phrase is in the category of data science talks or in the category of integration services talks. So let's dig into some data cleansing. What I have is a Jupyter notebook. It covers the data science process. Uh, share a link to where you can grab this notebook at the end of the talk today. And I cover things like business understanding up at the top. So here's where we get to the data. All of our code today is in R. If you're not familiar with R, that's fine. Uh, we'll just walk right through it. So it should be pretty easy to follow. I am going to have to kill and restart Jupyter, it looks like. So let me do that. It should take just a moment to reconnect. Yep, I wish to leave that. So here I'm in data science process. I'm going to open up my survey. And I'll scroll back down again. 
run this. There we go. Now it looks like it's going to load. I have a few packages in R. These libraries are going to give me useful tooling. For example, the tidyverse is a set of opinionated packages in R designed to help you with data cleansing. Excel Connect is a library that helps you read Excel files. Excel Connect does require that you have Java installed on your computer, so that's a downside. There is one uh, Excel library that is part of the tidyverse, that is read Excel, and that one does not require that you have Java installed. I have a few other libraries that I'll use throughout the course of this talk. Uh, the big one at the bottom is Keras. Keras allows me to build neural networks. So Keras is a framework that I can use to develop in other neural network uh, applications like TensorFlow or PyTorch or Microsoft's Cognitive, uh, Cognitive Network Toolkit, CNTK. So I'm going to use TensorFlow today for my neural network and uh, process it through Keras. The first thing I'd like to do is load up this data professional salary survey. And I've already looked through it before, so I know what the columns are. If we take a quick look at this data, I can show you what the columns are. We have 6,000 observations of 26 variables. What that means is 6,011 rows, 26 columns. Some of these are very interesting. For example, salary in US dollars, that's the thing we want to predict. That's a very interesting variable. Some of them are not interesting. Uh, an example of that is timestamp. Timestamp is the exact time that a person filled out the survey. Not really that interesting for us. Counter. It's actually even less interesting. It is just the number one. The whole purpose of it there is so that people can perform aggregations in Excel. So we've got some stuff that's looking like it's going to be interesting, some stuff that looks like it won't be interesting. The first thing I need to do is filter down to just 2018. There were questions in the 2018 survey that were not asked in 2017. So I can't use the 2017 data if I'd like to use those new questions. And I do want to look at the new questions. That's more information, it's a more complete survey. So in order for me to be able to use it, I have to throw away the 2017 data. That leaves me with 3,113 respondents. For those respondents, we have some data points that are interesting and I've put them here on the screen. So you can read through them. Uh, these are the ideal data points that we wanna collect. As we start to go through this, I want to research those values, see if there are oddities, see if I can fix anything, and see if it makes it past my uh, initial step of, ooh, this looks interesting, into, oh, I can use this in my model. The first thing I want to do is run a function that is called rapply. What this does is, for each column in survey 2018, execute this function. That function, for the column, finds the, the number of unique values. Survey year has one value, it's just 2018. Timestamp has 3,112 values. What's interesting here is there were two people who filled out the survey at exactly the same time. That's the only interesting thing about timestamp. Otherwise, I'd throw it away. I don't need either of those. What I'm looking for as I go through this listing is how many unique values are there because for something like education, there are only five values. Well, this probably came from a drop-down list. There's almost no way that 3,100 people are gonna type in five strings. Even if it's a yes, no answer, you'll probably get more than five. Because somebody will say why, someone will say true, someone will say no, in, false, uh, maybe. You get somebody who's just being silly. 
you'll get more than five distinct answers. Same thing with managed staff. So a lot of these probably are coming from drop downs and are probably categorical. Salary, 865 distinct responses. That's something that somebody filled in. This is more of what I would expect, or 1900 postal codes. These are the types of things that probably were text fields that someone entered data directly into. As we go a bit further, I noticed that there were 70 some countries. So what I'm concerned about is that we may have several explanations of the same country. Uh, for example, I might have United States, USA, United States of America, America, and whatever else. We only have one United States in this data set, and that's good. If I had several, I would want to corral all of those values and put them into one United States. The reason I want to do that is if I group by country, having people in five separate subsets, which all are supposed to represent the same thing, can give me different results uh, than if they're all grouped together. So I have one United States, I have one India, I have one Austria, and so on. So this is good. This actually turns out that this was also from a drop down. So it's valid data in that regard. As far as employment statuses go, here are my examples. I've got full time, contractor, independent, and part time. Again, from a drop down, you know, these, these values kind of make sense. Up above, we saw the number of values. What I'd now like to get is the distinct set of values. And to do that, I'm going to use another package called data table and use a function on data table. For primary database, what I have out of 3,100 people, 2,900 use SQL Server. 100 use Oracle, basically no, no other respondents. This makes sense because uh, Brent's audience is primarily SQL Server people. So they're the ones who are going to have filled out this survey. But I have a dilemma. So I have 3,100 total respondents. 90 plus percent selected that. I have one person who said Cassandra. I can learn nothing about salaries based on one result. The rule of thumb is you want n to be at least 30. Oops, so n greater than or equal to 30. That is a uh, low number for me personally because actually uh, what I want is like 30 to 100. So n is at least 30, ideally more than 100. And more specifically, for every combination of features, I want 30 to 100. So here, I've got 30 to 100. Well, that leaves me with SQL Server and Oracle. But if I add in employment status, well, now I have full-time, part-time, uh, independent, uh, independent or consultant slash contractor. Well, I've got four values, and for Oracle, I want 30 to 100 full-time, 30 to 100 part-time, 30 to 100 independent, and so on. That gives me, uh, I need at least 120 values. So even Oracle is like, ah, that's kind of low. In a perfect world, I would get 30 to 100 values for the cross product of all of my features. In reality, that is easily more than there are data platform professionals in the world. So I'm not going to get that. My compromise is, okay, I at least want 30 to 100 for a single category. Knowing that it's imperfect, knowing that I, I'm not going to have the best data possible, uh, at least it's realistic. I can expect to get something like this. So my dilemma here is, I think primary database is useful for explaining salary differences. I believe that somebody whose primary database is Microsoft Access will get paid differently from someone whose primary database is Teradata. 
or SQL Server or DB2 or Oracle, but I don't have enough rows in here to confirm that because with just nine access people, I can't tell you enough based solely on the data. Here's an, another example using employment sector. Here I have students. There are two students. Frankly, two is too small of a number. I'm just gonna throw those out. The rest of these are at least large enough for me to say, eh, it's okay. Federal government having only 76, it's a little bit low for my tastes, but the rest of them are okay. They're at least 100. Uh, next thing I wanna look at is some values that came from uh, people entering data, like years with this database. Turns out there are some people who put in weird values. I think these people probably put in what year they started, so maybe 15 years or 10 years of experience. I have no idea what these two people were doing. I have no idea what this person was doing. 53,000 years with a database is a long time. That's, that's a lot of commitment. So I was curious, uh, how much money do those people make? And it turns out they actually don't make that much more than the norm. So I believe what happens is that as you're going along, this is your salary, this is years with the database, you know, salary curve goes up and it flatlines. This is probably somewhere around a thousand years. So if you're working uh, on SQL Server for more than a thousand years, I recommend switching to something else. Uh, that's the type of great advice you're going to get from me today. So let's look at years with this kind of job. Now, those are more realistic numbers. 40 years, if you tell me you've been a developer for 40 years, all right, you were developing in the, the late 70s. I believe that. I know people who have been developing since the late 70s. So that's not outlandish. I'm gonna skip the database servers and go straight to hours worked per week because that one's more fun. One person worked 200 hours per week. Mind you, if you do the math, 24 times seven, you carry the two, you have 168 hours. 168 is less than 200. This person, one of two things is true. Either they have built a time machine and they travel back in time to work extra hours every week, or they have a perfect gig and they bill like lawyers, where if I get a call from one customer, well, that's six minutes automatically, and maybe it takes me one minute to solve their problem. I get a call from another customer, it takes one minute to solve their problem, I bill six minutes. Maybe they do that and they get the 200 hours per week because they're billing five customers for 40 hours a week. So I was curious, I don't think that's the case. Um, database people tend not to be as good at doing that as lawyers, so I think this person has a time machine. That person makes $120,000. If I had a time machine, I would make more than $120,000 a year. Second piece of good advice, if you have a time machine, don't spend it going back in time just to work extra hours. You can, you can find better uses for it. Uh, gender is an interesting scenario because there were drop down options, but there was a text box to fill in other. And so what you get is the internet. Basically, there are three viable options in here, male, female, and I'm just gonna group all this together as all other. There's some stuff in here. Basically, I don't, I don't wanna to get too much into, into the, the weeds of it. Um, I am going to lump them all together as everything else. As far as country goes, going back to my rule of thumb, 30 to 100 minimum. Unfortunately, if I do 30 to 100 minimum, I have three countries, US, UK, and Canada. Australia's close. Um, then we start getting into smaller and smaller numbers. So India has 40, Netherlands has 35, Sweden 47, even Germany, only 35 respondents. That's really small. I'm not comfortable with the country sizes, but I know that there is such a huge difference in uh, purchasing power across countries that I really have to keep this measure in. I could potentially try to combine things together and say, oh, well, France and Germany are both in the Eurozone. They're both gonna have the same macroeconomic variables. I, can't, I can hardly sell that to myself. 
especially with my example from the US earlier, where people working in one state can have radically different cost of living. Well, within Germany and France, if you're in one section of Germany or France, uh, cost of living would be quite different. So grouping together countries sounds like the wrong idea. If anything, I want to split them out further. So I'm just going to stick with 20, knowing that this is a uh, noisy result, because I think there's enough value, even in just 20 rows, that it's going to help me. Ideally, if I had the ability to, I would go to each one of those countries and commission a few hundred more survey responses. And hopefully that would give me some much better data. All right, so building our cleaned up data set. Basically, all the things that we learned, I want to apply those to our data. First, get countries with at least 20 people who responded to the survey. We filter on 2018. Throw away the person who had 200 hours a week. Throw away the students. Only include people in those countries where we have at least 20 respondents. Then I do some cleanup with uh, salaries. So I'll skip for time purposes exactly what's going on there. But basically, salary was brought in as a string, and I want to turn it into a number while dealing with uh, international differences in how we write salary information. If you have more than 32 years with the database, uh, I'm just going to say you're the median. Those were the people who had, for example, 2008. Yeah, that probably means when they started, but I don't know for sure. So in those cases, we're just going to plop you down in the median. Uh, with gender, male, female, and everything else goes into an other category. So after running this, um, I want to throw away the one person who had a salary of zero, and I want to throw out the columns that I don't actually need. From here, there are a few oddities. Uh, there are a few people who make more than 500,000 US dollars per year. And for all I know, these are completely legitimate. But I believe that there are at least a couple of them that are bogus. Like, for example, this person in New Zealand makes $620,000 to be a manager of a uh, nonprofit organization. It is a lot of money to pay a database administrator at a nonprofit organization in New Zealand. I'm a little squishy about whether that's actually real data or not. So what I'm going to do is say, I'll skip everybody above 500K. If you really do make more than 500K, my results are going to be bad for you. But the majority of people are making well under 500,000. Similarly, under 5,000, we have people where, for example, if you told me somebody works and makes $4,000 in South Africa, I would say, uh, this seems a little low, but it's not completely ridiculous. If you tell me that a person makes $81 in Canada, I'm going to say, that is ridiculous. I believe maybe for some of these, they either meant to do 81,000 or 81 per hour, which is 162,000. I don't know what the correct answer is, so I'm going to throw them away. Again, ideally, I can go back to the surveyors and get that information fixed. But in reality, I, I don't have that ability. I've got to go with what I've got. So briefly on data analysis, we have a few ways of exploring data. And this exploratory phase will help us get an idea of uh, what the data shape looks like, where things look like they may be going wrong. We've done some of that already with data cleansing. But we look at things like cardinality, that number of unique values. We used our apply to look at it across all columns. You can pop open Excel and see what it looks like here. A summary of a feature gives us five important values. The lowest and highest values, the 50th percentile, 25th and 75th percentile. In R, we get a bonus, which is the mean. I can plot that 
and create a box plot. So here I've got highest value, I've got lowest value, um, median, which is the 50th, 75th and 25th. And this also shows an interquartile range to give me a feeling of what is normal versus these, these dots, which are outliers. I can show the spread of data using a histogram. So how many people have a salary that is in, that is approximately this amount in US dollars? That's log base 10, so it's um, $100,000. I can track correlation between features. So as an example, um, the X and Y values on a diamond in this data set are almost perfectly correlated. Correlation's not the worst thing in the world, but if I'm doing a regression analysis, I don't want to have both of these in here because they're both going to fight for that change in the, the descriptive feature, the thing you're trying to predict, and can change, they can make your regression unstable. So I would throw out one of the two because they're basically telling you the same information. Depth and table has a much more moderate correlation. It's negative, that means that as one goes down, the other goes up, but they're not so tightly coupled that you, you don't have any real new information. So I'd keep both of those in that scenario. So let's go into our notebook again and look at the summary of uh, salaries. Our median salary in the survey is 92,000 US dollars. After throwing away the extreme low and high points, the low points probably are all bad data. The high points is probably at least half bad data, but I can't tell you for sure. So that leaves our summary looking like this. I can show that summary using ggplot and get a histogram. So scaling out, uh, this is $100,000. I know that my median is 92K, so it's right about there. Most salary information has a bit of a skew factor. So you may notice that the right-hand side drops off faster than the left-hand side. There are more people on the left-hand side of this curve than on the right-hand side. That's normal with salaries. There are more poor people than there are rich people, basically. And I can look uh, across different categories and filter. Well, a data scientist's median in our data set is 111,000. An app developer is 84K and a SQL developer is 87K. This fits my biases, although the max value is really low, which makes me wonder how many people who call themselves data scientists in this data set really are data scientists. And how many data scientists are there who didn't fill out any data in here? Important considerations. Uh, for modeling, there are five major steps. We need to take away, uh, or we need to build out the features that will be useful from our raw data. So we may perform calculations, we may aggregate data, we may process data to get the features we need. We can also remove features that are not important using feature selection. One example of this is dealing with collinearity. Well, that was the correlation that I talked about before, where one explanatory variable is so tightly coupled to another that it makes analysis less precise. My analysis gets better by removing one of those features. A spurious correlation is another example. Here's a, one of my favorite examples of spurious correlation. The number of people who drowned by falling into a pool matches very closely to the number of films that Nicolas Cage appears in as an actor. I don't know which causes the other, but you know, we can see that they're uh, closely tied together. Model training. We will take some data and designate it for training and then reserve the rest for evaluation. I need to have some data that my model has never seen so that it represents something close to reality. When we, decide, when we decide to train a model, we've got a few major branches of algorithms. The first is supervised learning. I need a label, like my salary. I'm gonna train a model to map input data to those labels so that I can predict a label given new input data. 
we are going to solve a regression problem. How much money should a DBA make? Well, you can also solve classifications. Which type of data professional is this? This is a person who uh, requires statistical, like a master's degree in statistics, and does this and this and this. Oh, well, you are a data scientist. Or uh, takes backups and restores databases, uh, runs CheckDB regularly. Oh, you're a production database administrator. That's the type of thing that we would build a classification model perhaps to predict. With unsupervised learning, we don't know the answers up front. We're trying to get to them. Clustering is an example. I have some data. I don't exactly know how they group together. I'd like to try to figure that out. I'll skip self-supervised self learning. It's a special case that's fairly uncommon. Reinforcement learning is where we can take an agent, train it, and observe how it behaves in an environment. This is an example that is called um, MarIO. Or actually, sorry, this is MariFlow. Um, this is a recurrent neural network that has been solved as, or created to solve Super Mario Kart levels. And it works pretty well. There's a YouTube video that I've linked to where the, the author goes into some detail on the process behind it. So here we have an agent, which is the uh, video game player, who's learning based on positive or negative reactions how to behave in certain scenarios. Okay, well, you're getting close to this wall, so I need to move over to the left, is an example of a behavior that it might learn. When it comes time to choose an algorithm, we have some trade-offs, and we have quite a few possibilities for every branch of this. Some of our trade-offs include accuracy. Some are more accurate than others. Some take longer than others. We may have a more difficult time understanding the result. Like with a neural network, we can have difficulty understanding how it got to the point that it did. Whereas with a decision tree, it's very easy to explain to an outside auditor how we got that result. Microsoft has their Azure Machine Learning Algorithm Cheat Sheet, and I like it as a starting point. This is certainly not all of the algorithms, but I can start in the middle and say, I am predicting values. So they say, okay, well, you have a regression problem. Here are about a dozen different possible regression answers. I might use a neural network. That's gonna take a while, but it will be accurate. I might use linear regression, very fast, but requires that you have linear uh, models, and so on. So I can get an idea for what some of the types of models are, uh, and, or some of the types of algorithms are, and use those to train my model. Once I have it, I train. Training is just solving math problems. So here's an example where I've got data, and all of these data points, and I'm laying on a regression line. That regression line is my model. I am predicting what the value ought to be for life expectancy based on national GDP per capita. Once I have my model in place, I want to validate it. One of the things I'm looking for is overfitting. Overfitting happens if my model latches onto the particulars of a data set. So it may not be able to generalize to new data. It may be really good at predicting with my training data, but won't work in the future. We use a completely separate set of information, that test data set, which our model does not get to see, as a way of checking how much overfitting happens. Because we have a training result, we have a testing result, and we see how much of a drop there is. If there is a big drop, we're overfitting our training data is much more accurate than our test data. If there's a small drop, we're not overfitting. We're doing a good job. Cross-validation is a technique to help you solve overfitting problems. Uh, we can also tune our models using what are called hyperparameters. So hyperparameters are ways that we can shape the training process in order to get a result. With a decision tree, uh, or well, let's say a random forest, we can have the number of trees in the forest, so how many decision trees we'll create, how deep those trees can be, how many levels we can have, 
we can have the technique that we're using bagging or bootstrap and those will give us different results. So we may try different combinations of these inputs to get our desired model. If you do use hyperparameter tuning, you'll want to have more data that you've never seen before and use that as your final check to see if your hyperparameter results are fine. Uh, so I talk a little bit about this evaluation process about rough percentages for what you might include. 60% for data training, 10 for validation, 20 for evaluation is a rough rule of thumb. Certainly don't have to use exactly these numbers. Ideally, I want to use as much data as I can training the model. And I reserve as much as I need for testing. So that's why training is almost always a higher percentage than testing. Now you can use a fitness function if you don't have a direct way of evaluating accuracy. You can build something like a genetic algorithm as a tool for this. So this is another uh, product. This is Mar.io, same author of Mariflow. This time, the person uh, has a neural network solving Super Mario World levels, and they use a genetic algorithm to help figure out how far in the level Mario got before he died. And if you get to the end of the level, hey, congratulations, you have the high score. So we have this genetic algorithm that's helping see how far, how successful the neural network was. Let's look at modeling very quickly over here. Uh, I'm going to break out my data 70% into training and 30% into testing. Once I have that data, I can build out what is called a recipe. A recipe is just a set of instructions that I'm going to follow as I shape my data to feed it into a model. Uh, my model will have training data and test data. So I remove salary and my salary will be the uh, Y values, train vector and test vector. So I have uh, data, which is inputs, and I have my label, which is the Y, the feature. For Keras, I'm going to build a model. This is a sequential model. I'm actually gonna run all of this right now so that it'll run while I'm talking. So I have a sequential model in Keras. I start with a dense layer, my inputs. So I'm getting my input shape. A ReLU activation function is a good starting activation function. Um, there are a few other options available to you. ReLU, if you don't, if you don't know that one is better uh, or that something is better than ReLU, I'd start with ReLU as opposed to something like a sigmoid function. We have dropout layers. Dropout layers purposefully lose information. They are to help prevent overfitting. At the end, I have a linear layer with no activation function. It will give me a number as my output. The numbers that I'm looking for, the metrics I'm looking for, in particular is MAE, uh, median absolute error. The nice thing about MAE is it's going to give me an error that is at the same magnitude and the same uh, type as my input. So here it's actually a, an error in dollars. So my model is accurate to within about $20,000. It's not a great start, it's an okay start. I think I can get a lot better as we move on, but as a, as a starting point, it's okay. Basically it's saying, eh, you have a moderately accurate model. So I can validate this, I can uh, get my results and see how much money that I might make in different scenarios. So for example, this was me when I came right out of college. Uh, this is me as a manager of a team, this is me as a manager of a team who happens to be Canadian. So Canadian me makes about 75% of US me. And so on. Uh, for deployment, that story is a little complicated. I'm going to have to zoom through it because I am out of time. But basically, historically deployment was all about taking a model and rewriting it in C or in C++. Today, we don't have to do that. We can have R or Python servers 
hosting a microservice that you can access through an API. So your .NET code can call my R service, get a result back, and get a prediction of how much money we think this person will make. I can use a tool like Deploy R, which will build up a server for me if I'm not familiar with uh, web development or service uh, development. The team that I work on, we are familiar with that, so we've built our own stacks. So we have a stack that's Web API that's running C Sharp that calls into SQL Server machine learning services that then runs Microsoft Machine Learning using R. That's one product we have. We have another product where we've got a Keras server, uh, a Python server that's running Keras. It's got a big neural network on it. We access that neural network using an API uh, a web service called Unicorn that implements Flask APIs. We have a reverse proxy using Nginx that we access from C Sharp. So there are quite a few different ways of getting to solutions. With this microservice architecture, you're plugging in these new APIs, other people can call it, but they don't have to change their skills. They don't have to change anything that they're doing. They just call your endpoint. Machine learning services, if you're not familiar with it, is a great way to uh, perform these analyses in production when your data is already in SQL Server. You can also build notebooks. We've walked through a notebook today. That's Jupyter Notebooks. You can use uh, Apache Zeppelin if you're running mostly in Spark. That's a good option there. Shiny is an interactive visualization product that combines both JavaScript especially D3 and R. So this is more for visualizing your data rather than integrating, but it's very pretty if you need visualization. So what comes next? Well, the job's not done after go live. We've got to keep checking the efficacy of models. Models change over time. Reality changes over time and makes your models less accurate. And you may find out that the data you were using for training isn't really what people use in, in practice, or it's different from what people have in practice. So occasionally you will want to retrain your models. And depending on your choice of algorithm, you can update that model with the latest information. If you're able to automatically feed data back into your model and get a new model, this is machine learning, where you're taking the outputs of the model, checking them against reality, feeding those back in to the model itself to train it further. Some algorithms will allow you to do that. Others, like linear regression, you have to retrain it from scratch. If you retrain it from scratch, that's not a problem. Uh, just be, be aware of what your algorithms allow you to do. And be okay with iterating. You know, those stakeholders, you're going to want to give them results I may give my stakeholders this first result and say, here's where I'm at so far, here's our accuracy. And they can come back and say, no, that's way too inaccurate, we need better. And then I can spend more time on it. Or we may get to a point where I say, this is the best that I can get with our data that we have today. And we can decide whether to go live with it or to cancel the project. Um, but try to do this in an iterative fashion, reacting quickly, changing quickly so that you can get the best possible results. At the end of the day, data plumber's work is never done. There's always going to be another thing to do. So we've covered a lot today. Uh, this is a very broad topic. If you'd like to get more information, like the slides, the notebooks, links to additional resources, all of that is at csmore.info slash on slash data science. If you have any questions at all uh, after this webinar, please feel free to reach out to me. Twitter or email. With that, my slides are done. So I'd like to say thank you and uh, see if we have any questions uh, in chat. All right. Uh, thanks a lot, Kevin, for that wonderful webinar today for the Data Platform Geeks community. Uh, so I don't see any questions as of now, but I do have a couple of slides. I'll quickly run through it. And meanwhile, the attendees, if any questions, they can put it down in, in the uh, Q&A panel. So sure. I'll, yeah, thanks, Kevin. I'll quickly share my screen. Yep, let me.
All right. So a few, few quick slides. Uh, if you have any questions beyond this webinar, uh, you can always post it on our Facebook, LinkedIn, and or and on our Telegram group on mobile. Uh, the uh, the community is always there to answer, and uh, you can always ask your questions. Uh, we have the SQL Maestro Learning Solutions that I was mentioning earlier. We recently concluded the master classes. Uh, we uh, by international experts from various countries on uh, various topics like Power BI, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and SQL Server, of course. We have, we are also coming up with a video course of the popular uh, training on SQL Server performance tuning by Amit Bansal. It will be out soon, but you can go ahead and register yourselves right away for discounts. You can watch it anywhere and from any corner of the world and how many other times you want to. Uh, we have a unique uh, unique method of learning called the hands-on labs. Uh, since you're all DPG members, you can access all of these, uh, hands uh, some of the demos for free. We have the learning kits, again, based on the SQL Server performance tuning by Amit Bansal. And if you have uh, any requirement of SQL Server health check, you can always write to us. Our official website is sqlmaestros.com. You can find all these options there, and you can always write to us at contact at sqlmaestros.com. So the pre-cons, uh, like I was mentioning earlier, uh, we have already announced the pre -cons. We have 16 pre-cons announced uh, with the speakers and the abstracts as well. So there are a lot of topics on Power BI, Azure, SQL Server, uh, machine learning, AI, data science, and whatnot. So you can go to our website, dps10.com, and uh, go through all of these, and uh, you can choose the pre-con that you want to attend. And yes, the first uh, set of speaker announcement has been done. We have 12 speakers coming down from seven countries to Bangalore uh, this August to deliver uh, set, uh, to deliver sessions and the pre-cons. So um, uh, make sure you do not miss this. Uh, and of course, uh, as you all are aware, the price increases on the first of every month. So if you uh, want to book early, if you if you are if you, you if you want to join us for the pre-cons or the summit, you just make up your mind quickly and uh, register yourself for the lowest price. So for the uh, people who are joining us for the first time today, we also have events uh, that we do at Microsoft offices and various uh, other companies or, or Pan India. Uh, we have our upcoming uh, events are in Bengaluru at Microsoft uh, on April 6th. Uh, Amit Bansal will be presenting his uh, popular SQL Server memory internals training there, uh, which was uh, which is a world-renowned training by uh, at various conferences delivered at various conferences, and it has been uh, it has received some great feedback. So make sure you do not miss that and do join us on April 6th. We then have an event on April 13th and on April 20th in Hyderabad. So you can visit dataplatformgeeks.com/events and register yourself right away. With that, I am done too. Uh, so thanks a lot, uh, everyone, for joining us today. And thanks a lot, Kevin, for uh, uh, delivering a wonderful webinar again. Uh, we will be posting a webinar pick uh, on our LinkedIn and Facebook groups. So pl uh, please do give your valuable feedback. That will help us and uh, the speaker uh, do better in the coming webinars. So uh, we will be sending you an email with the links to the, our Facebook and LinkedIn groups. Do make, make sure you join. And uh, please do give your feedback in the comments. Then. Thanks a lot. Uh, so let me just quickly check if there are any questions. Uh, and you post a recording on YouTube. Uh, yes, we will be posting the uh, recording in, in the upcoming week. So uh, we, we will let you know once we do that. So Kevin, I don't see any more questions, but if uh, any questions pop, pops up after this webinar, if they write to us, I will definitely uh, send that to you and uh, maybe you can answer that. Sure thing. All right. Thanks a lot, Kevin. Thank you once again for joining us. And uh, just to let you all know, Kevin will be delivering another webinar on April 18th, same time, 9 to 10. Uh, make sure you join us there as well. Thank you. Thank you so much.